So far on our journey to the planets, we have encountered worlds that are made up mostly of rock, worlds that are shaped by the forces of geologic activity. We know for a fact that Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars have been shaped by both tectonic forces and by volcanoes. We also know that, with the exception of Mercury, all of the inner planets have an atmosphere. But what happens when we leave the inner part of our solar system and visit the outer planets? We no longer find planets that are made of rock. Instead, we find planets that are, in effect, total atmospheres. They are all, except for the tiny planet Pluto, made up entirely of gas. The outer planets are still worth our study, however, for many different reasons, not the least of which being the diversity of their moons, which, by the way, are solid. The outer planets exhibit weather patterns that boggle the mind. Some hurricanes on the outer planets travel at supersonic rates well in excess of 800 miles an hour. Yet even at those horrendous velocities, they behave much in the same way as hurricanes on Earth. The magnetic fields of the outer planets are so immense that in the case of Jupiter, over one million rads of radiation spew forth from the planet. That is over 2,500 times the amount of radiation needed to kill a human being instantly. Yet the magnetic field of Jupiter behaves much in the same way as Earth's. Thus, there is much to be learned from studying the gas giants. So now we move on to a place of great wonder and mystery, a place which, as we speak, is under mankind's direct observation, a place which will one day be the way station on our journey to the stars. When we travel past Mars, we encounter an area known as the asteroid belt within which are billions of chunks of ice and rock of various sizes. This seems to be either the remnants of a once mighty planet that was perhaps destroyed by a massive collision, or most probably, an area where the junk of the solar system is gathered. In any case, it forms the demarcation line between the inner and outer planets. The asteroid belt is a collection of small to medium-sized chunks of the types of materials that formed the planets originally. They're mostly rocks, uh, some of them are rocks mixed with iron, others are rocks that have a, a uh, high content of organic carbon-bearing materials. The current theories of the origin of the solar system suggest that it's basically leftover materials from the formation of the solar system that didn't get themselves into a planet and didn't get close enough to Jupiter to get flung out of the solar system, as uh, we believe happened with many of the comets, which were perturbed gravitationally out to the outer solar system and now come back to visit us every once in a while uh, as a result of, uh, of perturbations from other stars. Now, up until now, we have focused on the inner planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, all of which are rocky in nature and have atmospheres made up primarily of oxygen compounds. The outer planets, that is Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto, are all, with the exception of Pluto, made up almost entirely of gas and gas in a liquid state. All have atmospheres that are based on hydrogen compounds, and all, once again, with the exception of Pluto, are absolutely enormous in size when compared to Earth. The first of the gaseous planets is Jupiter. Now, to say that Jupiter is large is, is to be guilty of an incredible understatement. Jupiter is enormous. By far the biggest planet of the system, it contains more mass than all the other eight planets combined. To get an idea of exactly how large Jupiter is, witness this. The Earth has a diameter of roughly 8,000 miles. Jupiter is 89,000 miles in diameter. It is 318 times as massive as our planet and contains 1,300 times as much volume. Jupiter is formidable indeed. It is essentially a star that failed to ignite. If you analyze the chemical composition of the Sun and Jupiter, you find that they are remarkably the same. The only difference is that of size. 
For had Jupiter been larger by a factor of 10, it would have collapsed upon itself and lit, thereby giving us a binary star system, one where we would have had two suns in the sky. Life would be very different on Earth had that happened. But it did not, so we are left with a planet which is, in reality, a huge ball of gas with a liquid center and possibly a rocky core. Where the planet derives its distinctive coloration remains a mystery, but one theory stands out as the most plausible. You see, Jupiter exhibits the strongest magnetic field of all the planets, and as such, creates millions of lightning bursts per day. This, in turn, mixes and matches the molecules in the atmosphere to form various hydrocarbons, what we on Earth call smog. Possibly, it is these differing hydrocarbons that give Jupiter its color. This also creates another intriguing possibility. As hydrocarbons are formed and burned, a waste product is created. This waste product is carbon, the most basic and stable element in the universe. Now, since carbon is heavier than hydrogen or helium, it would sink towards the core of the planet. As it sunk deeper and deeper, the temperature and pressure would be an astounding one million times the surface pressure of Earth. Now, we have evidence on our own planet of what happens to carbon, which is heated to extreme temperatures and subjected to intense pressure. The carbon atoms realign themselves in the tightest, most orderly, most stable fashion in the universe. The center of Jupiter, then, may very well be a solid diamond the size of the planet Earth. The planet rotates once every nine hours, so the clouds are spread out as various bands. The most distinctive area of Jupiter that has been observed and formed the most speculation has been what is called the Great Red Spot. And it is just that, a giant red spot on the visible surface. Once again, we do not know why it is red, nor why it has existed for at least three centuries. However, it appears to be a huge storm of sorts raging in the upper atmosphere. The great red spot is, is essentially a very large weather system, whether you want to call it a storm or a big high pressure zone, doesn't really matter too much. It's a, an exceedingly large weather system with the cyclonic, cyclonic pattern that we see in large weather systems on the Earth, huge hurricanes, typhoons, large high pressure ridges, things like that. But as I mentioned before, it's larger than the entire planet Earth. And its size is one of the reasons it persists for so long. As far as we know, the Great Red Spot is, is effectively a storm on Jupiter that's been going on for 300 years. big problem with future manned exploration of the Jupiter system, uh, movies such as 2001 and 2010 notwithstanding, is the uh, environment around Jupiter. Uh, we can imagine getting spaceships that can get there properly and so forth, but the radiation environment around Jupiter is exceedingly intense. It's far more violent than the uh, Van Allen radiation belts around the uh, around the Earth and would subject potential astronauts to a hideously large dose of, of high energy particle radiation unless some way can be found in the future to shield astronauts effectively from that by generating their own magnetic fields, for instance, within spacecraft, something of that sort. Our electronics on Galileo are designed to withstand radiation in the range of one million rads. 400 rads makes you very dead. Though it is unlikely that manned expeditions will ever travel to Jupiter and attempt to enter the atmosphere there, it is beneficial for us to study it with robot orbiters and probes in order to further our understanding of how planetary processes work so that we might apply those lessons to our own home planet, Earth. But there is an even better reason to study Jupiter, its moons. Jupiter has at least 16 known satellites and probably dozens of smaller ones as yet unobserved. Some of these moons are as big, if not larger, than some of the planets, and as such, provide us with intriguing possibilities. For if life, other than that on Earth, is to be found in the solar system, it will most likely be found in the moons of Jupiter. The satellites of Jupiter, the four big satellites of Jupiter, range in size from lunar-sized Io and Europa to the size of Mercury, Ganymede, and Callisto. 
and the, the two size, size ranges are also quite different in their character. Ganymede and Callisto are fairly light bodies. They have densities that are only about twice that of, of water. And we believe that most of their, their bulk is made up of a mixture of, of rock, about 50%, and ice, about 50%. They're effectively glacier giants, if you will. While all of Jupiter's moons are intriguing, some require closer examination than others, the first of which would be the moon called Europa. Europa is fascinating in that its surface is entirely covered with water ice, ice which is as smooth as a billiard ball and crisscrossed by thousands of huge dark lines. It has been theorized that the marks in the surface of Europa are really cracks in the ice caused by the upwelling of liquid water below the surface much the same as is observed in the polar caps here on Earth. So we know that sufficient warmth must be present on Europa at lower depths to sustain the kinds of life forms that we have in our own oceans. And water, being the universe's greatest solvent, is the ultimate medium for organic compounds to join and begin forming that rarest of commodities, life. Of course, this is purely speculation, but we do know that Europa is covered entirely with water ice, and even that presents us with the exciting possibilities of manned European cities beyond our own Earth. The rest of Jupiter's moons hold very little hope of life for us, or other extraterrestrial organisms as well, but each is interesting in its own right, and each can lead us to a better understanding of our own planet. Io, the third largest moon of Jupiter, is one of the reddest objects in the solar system, due entirely to its incredible amount of volcanic activity. It appears that Io is covered from pole to pole with huge erupting volcanoes and is clearly the most geologically active spot in the system. This appears to be caused by the incredible magnetic forces emanating from its parent planet and that of its neighbor Europa. Io, the satellite of Jupiter, has active volcanoes on it. It's a very hot planet, and the, the source of that heat is interactions with Jupiter and other satellites. You have resonances, and those resonances tend to, to pump energy into the satellite. Locked in a constant tug of war, tremendous forces constantly push and pull the moon so that it is kept at a constant boil. Even as such, Io does have a bit of an atmosphere, composed mainly of sulfur dioxide, the same stuff that you can find in the atmosphere of Venus. While poisonous to man, it does serve to shield the moon's surface from the intense barrage of charged particles raining down from Jupiter. Man could land on Io, but he probably wouldn't stay too long. Ganymede is the largest of Jupiter's moons. At 3,275 miles in diameter, it is bigger than the planets Mercury and Pluto. It is believed that Ganymede has a thin atmosphere comprised of oxygen and water vapor. If this is the case, then the possibility of human habitation will be greatly enhanced. This does not appear to have anywhere near the internal heat that Europa has. Therefore, its surface of mixed rock and water ice appears to be solid through and through. Life may have evolved here in an earlier time, but the chances of finding it now are exceedingly slim. Callisto is the second largest of the Jovian moons and is composed of mostly rock and water ice. It is the most heavily cratered satellite in the system and as such, it serves as an indication that the other three moons must have very active cores in order to have managed to obliterate the great majority of their impact craters. Much can be gained by the study of Jupiter and its moons, and such study can begin with the Galileo project scheduled to arrive in the Jovian system in the mid-1990s.
The probe comes in two parts, an orbiting pickup satellite and a smaller lander, which will be separated from the orbiter and dropped into the atmosphere. There, it will radio back its analysis of the gas clouds it will encounter, doing so until it is crushed by the intense pressure within the deepest regions of the planet. Before it perishes, however, it will provide us with the first detailed atmospheric analysis of the largest planet in the solar system. Saturn is the second largest planet in the solar system and the sixth planet from the sun. Despite its immense size, its mean density is less than that of water. Clearly, Saturn is made up of very light stuff indeed. It cannot be much more than a giant gas bag mixture of hydrogen and helium. Saturn is the best known to us because of its prominent ring structure, a structure first observed and reported by Galileo in 1610. It was some time later when scientists deduced the true nature of the rings. Before the 19th century, it was believed that the rings of Saturn were part of the planet, a solid mass, like a halo, if you will, that was connected to the planet's surface. It was presumed by some early astronomers that life must exist on such a grand place. Well, we know now exactly what the rings are. They are essentially small chunks of water ice that circle the planet upon a single orbital plane. While it is 250,000 miles wide, it is only a few yards thick. The ring system is obviously either the remnants of matter which combined to form the planet some five billion years ago, or what is left over from the breakup of a very large orbiting satellite. Seen close up by the Voyager spacecraft, the rings reveal an incredible intricacy. The clumps of ice move in cascading waves and form exquisite symmetrical patterns. Well, Saturn, of course, has been known as the, the ring planet ever since uh, people first started looking at it with telescopes back in the 17th century. Saturn's rings are by far and away the most beautiful and prominent ring system. They're the only ones you can see easily from ground-based telescopes, for instance. I think one of the most exciting things anybody has ever done in their astronomical career is their first look at Saturn through a really big telescope. It's really, really mind-blowing. The interior of Saturn is most certainly made up of hydrogen in a liquid state, and more exotically, at the deeper regions, liquid metallic hydrogen, formed when the increasing pressures force electrons off of the hydrogen atoms, thereby forming a metal. This metal may make up the core of Saturn, or we could have another planet-sized diamond. Nothing is certain yet. Saturn itself is something like uh, two-thirds to three-quarters of a Jupiter. It's a large ga liquid gas planet, very similar in Jupiter in its overall composition, but uh, displaying different types of atmospheric features, which are quite interesting. As is Jupiter, Saturn could be said to be a star that failed. However, the failure was much more pathetic in the Saturnian case, as it would require that the planet be hundreds of times more massive in order to become a star rather than the mere 10 of Jupiter. Saturn has the most extensive satellite system of all the planets and also possesses the second largest moon of all, the giant Titan. At over 3,100 miles in diameter, Titan is larger than the planets Mercury or Pluto and has a considerable atmosphere as well, an atmosphere comprised mainly of nitrogen. 
Up until recent times, it was presumed that Earth was the only place in the solar system where nitrogen was predominant. Now we see that Saturn's moon not only has a nitrogen atmosphere, but it is 60% denser than our own. Beneath a haze of cloud cover, complex chemical reactions take place which form the main components of Titan. Though it has an upper atmosphere similar to ours, the extreme cold temperatures prohibit the development of any kind of life similar to our own. After all, Titan is about 10 times farther from the sun than we are. Yet Titan could turn out to be a most fascinating place. In the Saturn system, there are several very interesting bodies with respect to this. One of them is Titan. It's been known to have an atmosphere since 1948 when Gerard Kuiper discovered it. And um, that atmosphere is primarily nitrogen. It's the first really massive nitrogen atmosphere we've found any place in the solar system other than the Earth. It has a surface pressure about one and a half times the surface pressure at the Earth, that nitrogen atmosphere, methane in the atmosphere. The methane at the upper layers of the atmosphere is subjected to radiation from the solar ultraviolet rays and from particles from the radiation belts of Saturn, and organic synthesis takes place. You'd think this is a great place for developing life. You see, the temperature on Titan is estimated to be about the triple point of methane, what we call natural gas. That means that the temperature is such that with minor variations up or down, methane can go from being a gas to a liquid and then to a solid. This is the case on Earth, where water can exist as steam, then cool to become liquid, and within a few degrees, freeze to solid ice. That would mean that on Titan, it probably rains liquid methane into a sea or river of liquid methane. And in the northern and southern poles, it snows methane crystals onto glaciers made up of methane ice. One other satellite of Saturn bears some observation, and that is Enceladus. Enceladus is very similar to Europa in many ways, in that it seems to have its own internal source of heat. This heat serves to melt the lower levels of ice on the moon into a slushy liquid, and at greater depths, this liquid may reach temperatures capable of sustaining life. As a surface, it's very similar in its appearance in some ways to uh, the surface of Europa. It has very smooth areas on it, uh, it's obviously been resurfaced. There are areas that have very few meteorite craters on them. We don't know for sure where that energy is coming from. Just radioactive heating is, is very hard to, uh, uh, it's very hard with just radioactive heating to produce enough uh, heat to melt an object that small. We think it may be, again, akin to Io and Europa in getting tidal energy from, uh, from Saturn, although the theoreticians have not been able to come up with quite enough energy to to do the job, nature has obviously figured out how to do it. Enceladus is a very interesting place and might tell us a lot about these energy sources. The surface is remarkably free of craters and other evidence of geologic activity. This primarily is due to the continuous motion and regeneration of its ice crust from upwelling liquid water currents. At 310 miles in diameter, Enceladus could potentially be the smallest dwelling of possible life in the solar system. Perhaps because they are the biggest and most colorful of the outer planets, Jupiter and Saturn receive much of our attention. But being relatively close to us is advantageous as well. Jupiter and Saturn can both be seen and studied by everything from mountain observatories to backyard telescopes. Together, through their moons, they offer a tremendous sample of the variety of worlds available for our exploration in the future. One thing stands clear. If we are to find a place for ourselves in the outer solar system, it will be near one of the two stars that failed.